Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. We have an exciting, exciting hour plan. We're really talking about the fact that who's front of Viking has existed for 150 years. Isn't that amazing that we have had such amazing machines over all of these years? And we're going to talk a little bit about what makes one machine different than another. And everybody's going to learn something. I promise somewhere on the line, along the line, everybody will learn something. There are a lot of different people that are here with us today. Some of them are interested in looking for a new machine. Some of them are just trying to find out something about the machine they have. And when we start, we're going to like just kind of play around and think a little bit about what has changed over the years. So I did pull up a, a couple of different slides that show some of our older machines. And for many of you that have been Husqvarna Viking, um, long-term Husqvarna Viking people, you're going to know some of these machines as we talk about them. And then we're going to talk about what makes a machine different today compared to, uh, you know, like maybe the difference between a 116, an Emerald 116, and an Emerald 118. But before we start there, we're just going to go and do a little look back to see at some of the machines that when I started working with Husqvarna Viking that we were having in our, our long line. And they were in there for quite a long time. My original first Viking that I ever had, my first Husqvarna Viking was called Husqvarna and it was an Optima 630. And that was a machine that was in the 80s and it had the ability to stop with a needle down and it had some decorative stitches. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because that was really, that was much more than I had with my old machine that um, basically did a straight stitch and a zigzag. So let's just switch over here for a minute. And what we're looking at on the screen is the uh, some of the machines that were around 20 some odd years ago. And we have the Daisy 315 was like a basic entry level machine. Today, a new machine that would be equal or around the same as the Daisy 315 would be the Emerald 116. And then in the line, we had a Freesha 415. And the machine that would be the most like the Freesha 415 would probably be the Opal 650. And maybe the Jade uh, 20, you could make an argument for that. And then our top of the line sewing machine back then that was a sewing only machine was the Lily 555. And today a machine that would look like that um, and have a lot of those same abilities, but so much more would be the Brilliant 75Q. And then we had our first embroidery machine 25 years ago. That was the number one plus, or some people called it the Orchidea, especially if you didn't live in the United States. And today we have our entry level, the Jade 35, and it does a larger embroidery than the one plus could do. It can, the Jade 35 does a 240 by 150, and, uh, but it has less sewing skills to it. So what I want you to think about is today, I want you to challenge me, okay? What questions do you have about your machine? And if you're thinking about a new machine, what would be the most important things to you? I'm going to talk about what I think are the most important things. And as we go from the emeralds up into some of the higher level ones, I'll, I'll show you some comparisons and we'll talk about what makes one machine different or better than the other. And what has really changed from 25 years ago to today? And sometimes it's just some basic things like our sewing machines, all of our sewing machines today, except for the emeralds, you can change the density of a stitch, which is just fabulous. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to switch back over here just for a second. And we're going to go, let me just come back out here to the full screen so you see everything. And we're going to go to the next slide. And see if this is the one I want right here. Oh, it's not moving. Look at that. All right. Maybe it became disconnected. So we'll come back to that screen anyways and look at it. So if you know the Emerald, when I pull up that so that um, slide, it will uh, it should show up, but we'll see what happens. Something's disconnected there. Um, so if you know the Emerald, the Emerald is the very basic sewing machine. The Emerald 116 has 16 stitches, and the Emerald 118 looks almost identical to it and has 
18 stitches. Now, why would you have two machines that look like they're so close together, but they actually are not? There's four things that are different. One of them is the one, the Emerald 118 has a needle up down. It can stop with the needle in the down position. And it is, um, it has two more stitches. The Emerald 16 has 16 stitches. The Emerald 18 has 18 stitches. But one of the real differences is that on a Emerald 118, it has a separate foot control and power plug. And so that means that you have an electronic foot control that gives you a lot more power and a lot more control when you're sewing. So in a, with an electronic foot control that is separate from the plug, no matter what brand you're looking at, right? If you're looking at a machine, you're going to get a better sewing experience if you have a separate plug and a separate foot control because your foot pedal is going to be much more controlled. And when you stop, it's going to stop exactly where you want to. Instead, if you're used to a mechanical machine, you'll know that when you stop, sometimes the needle will keep going up. Well, the uh, Emerald 118 is a much nicer experience for that. And then the other thing, um, you know, like, so those are the kinds of things that you think about. For me, if I had a choice between a 116 and a 118, I'd definitely go to the 118 because it's got a lot of the features I'm looking for. So if you're looking for maybe a small machine that you want to carry to classes, then that is a really good choice because it's very lightweight. I think it's somewhere between 16 and 18 pounds and it doesn't weigh very much, but it's going to give you that ability to have that needle to stop in the down position if you're piecing a quilt or something like that. Um, we had a question about where does the 990 come into all of that mix? And what I'm going to do, I made this little uh, PowerPoint at the end, and we're going to go through at the end, and I'll go through from the very first machine to the very last machine so that you can kind of see the progression of what the first machine looked like and then where the machines have come from all over uh, from 150 years ago till now and what new features they have that might make a difference. Now I'm just going to disconnect my PowerPoint here and see if I can get it to reconnect the way that it's supposed to be here. Let's see if we go. Yes, now we're looking at what we want. No, it's still the other slide. I wish I could say why it was doing that, but it looks like it's going to stay that way. All the best laid plans. Now, the the designer one uh, somebody commented about the designer one floppy we're gonna really kind of go and play a little bit more about that and i just cannot for the life of me figure out how i'm going to get this powerpoint to work so just hold on a second and i'm going to give it a try all right and because i think it's it's nicer for you to see pictures of everything if we can my computer closed down on me just before i started to open this here so i'm going to just reload it and start it back up again. All right. So I have some machines that are here with me that we're going to um, we're going to look at. Yeah, it was a. Let me just see. Sorry, just hold on one second. I swear I'll be right with you. I'm trying to see if I can get my mouse. I'm just going to shut this down and we'll reload it up there again. So when I'm looking at the opals. For example, the opals would be the step up from an emerald 116 and 118, but there is another machine that's in that mix. That would be the Jade 20. The Jade 20 is a machine that would go in between the sapphire and, uh, sorry, the um, emeralds. Oh my goodness gracious, something is going crazy with my computer. Let me see if I can get this working. Sorry about this. I really want to see you the slides. Let's see. There we go. Excellent. Okay. So now we finally got it working. It's not a miracle. So here's a picture of the two Emerald 116 and Emerald 118. And here you can see you have on the 118, you've got the needle up down and you've got speed control. Speed control is very, very important. If you're going to be working with kids, if you're going to sew and you like to sew a little bit slower, and it's got the separate foot and plug and, and pedal. Now, when we go into embroidery, the, the machines that you're seeing here, these are the machines that are in our line currently. The, uh, the J35 is our very first embroidery machine. 
And then we have the topaz 40 and 50. And the difference between all of these has to do with the size of the hoop. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. Then we have the Sapphire 85. We have the designer Ruby 90 and then the Epic 2. So I think what's important here is to realize a lot of people wonder where the Brilliance 80, the Diamond Royale and the Ruby Royale fit into this line. And the Sapphire 85 replaced the Brilliance 80. And it also replaced the Diamond Royale and the Ruby Royale. It does have the deluxe stitch system. And it also has the sensor system. And let's just go to one more slide here. Oh, that goes back to the very first machine. Isn't that amazing to think that was the very first machine that was made in 1872? So let me come back. And I'm going to come back. Now, here we are on our slide where you can see that the very first set of sewing machines, because a lot of times people have questions about the difference. What is a, a sewing machine? What's an embroidery machine? So these are our current sewing machines in the line, the Emerald 116 and 118. Then you've got the J20, which is a very, very modern look and very fascinating. And I love this machine. It's got a lot of features to it. But then we get into the Opal 650, 670, and the 690Q. So you might wonder why you would choose a 690Q over the 650 or 670. Well, there are some very important reasons for that. First of all, the, the machine that you're seeing in front of me, this is the Opal 690Q. It is the first machine that has all of the features that you would find on your embroidery machine, like the automatic cut, the start stop button. These are all here and it has the sensor system. So if you start sewing, the foot will go down on its own. And if you choose to set it, so the needle is gonna stop in the, uh, the down position. Now, when I sew, it will remember, I'm gonna choose a different stitch. All right, I'm just going to go over here and I'll choose the stitch. You can see it's got a touch screen. And if I was to choose a stitch number, now I've chosen stitch number. It's the, a smaller touch screen than you would get on some of the other machines, but it works exactly the same way. But what I love about the Opal 690Q is it has the same sensor system that you will find on a Designer Epic 2 and on a Ruby 90 and on all of our machines, sewing machines from this point up. And if I go backwards and I want to cut, then I've got my automatic cut there. And it lifts the foot up and cuts the thread all in one step. So that's an important point to think about when you're looking at a new machine. And you have to think about what is important to me. For me, the best machine to take if you have an embroidery machine that has a sensor system, the Opal 690Q is the best choice if you're looking for a small machine to take it to class. Because it's got the automatic cut and it has got the sensor system. So when you stop with the needle down, the foot will lift up automatically. You don't really have to relearn how to do everything. The other machines that are below the 690Q, because they don't have the sensor system, it means that if you're use, you know, taking it to class, you've got to kind of relearn how you're using it a little bit because the foot doesn't go up and down on itself. So I've got some questions coming in and I'm actually really excited to see all these questions. And so there's a question about the Sapphire 80, uh, 830, which is not in the line anymore. And let's look back here at this list, okay? So right now, the machines that are in the line, we go from the Opals, the 650 to the 670, the 690Q. Remember, if you have the sensor system already and you're looking for a second machine, the, sec the 690Q is the way you want to go. Now, the Sapphire 930 replaced the 830. Whoops, sorry, I changed my slide. The Sapphire, I'm not very good at running a PowerPoint, obviously. Let me go. There we go. I got to keep my hands off the buttons. I tend to use my mouse. So the Sapphire 
930 would give you the same features as a Sapphire 830. There are some extra things that were added in there. But if you're going to upgrade, I would like this is kind of why I wanted you to think about this. If you're looking to buy a new machine, buy a machine that's going to take you into the next 10 or 20 years. Don't buy a machine that's exactly what you've got. So for me, if I was looking for a new sewing machine, I would be up and I had a Sapphire 830, for example, I'd be looking at the brilliant 75Q and maybe the Epic 95Q because the Epic 95Q is gives you this huge space. Let's look at this. This is right now what you're seeing on the screen. That is the Epic 2. The Epic 95Q has exactly that same throat space. So look at the size of this. This quilt is like a large king size quilt. Without any effort at all, I have all the space that I need to quilt my quilts. And this is one of the best things about the Epic line of machines and the Ruby 90. Now, you've got a large tablet-like screen. And this is just like having an iPad where you can select the stitch. And our Epic 95Q is the top of the line sewing machine. It will be able to do nine millimeter stitching. So for those of you that are thinking, what is important? If you like decorative stitches, there are two machines in our line that the op stitch plate opening is nine millimeters. That would be the Epic 95Q and the Designer Epic 2 that I just showed you. And there's quite a bit of difference between a seven millimeter stitch and a nine millimeter stitch. Look at the difference between that, those two stitches. So if decorative stitches are important to you, that's the one thing you wanna think about. When we're looking at the machines in our line, and let me come back here for a second, okay? When we're looking at the sewing machines, just the sewing machines, not embroidery, and I'll come to embroidery in a little bit. If you're just looking at the sewing machines, the Opal 650 has uh, seven millimeter stitches. The Sapphire 930 has seven millimeter stitches. And so does the Brilliant 75Q. But the Epic 95Q has the stitch plate opening of a nine millimeter stitch. It also has a built-in walking foot to it. So that would be really important to consider that built-in walking foot is like a whole new experience in sewing. So the top of the line sewing machine is the Epic 95Q. It'll give you that massive throat space. It gives you all of your nine millimeter beautiful decorative stitches. And it is the best sewing machine on the market. It doesn't do embroidery and it can't be upgraded, but it is absolutely the best sewing machine on the market. All right. Now the 75, the brilliant 75 and many of our machines can do omni motion stitches. So even though the open stitch plate opening is not nine millimeters, we have hundreds of stitches that have this larger opening to them and make it a lot of fun to sew with and a lot of fun to quilt with actually. Now, after we, we'll go back if there's any more questions about sewing machines in a minute, but I do wanna to touch base on what's the difference between the embroidery machines. The difference between the sewing machines is at the Opal 690Q, you have the sensor system. And when you get up to the uh, Brilliance 75, you have Omnimotion stitches, which are big, wide stitches. And then the Epic 95Q has it all. It has the walking foot that's built in. It has nine millimeter stitches. And it has got that fabulous space. And it's got an automatic needle threader. I'll show you that if anybody wants to see that later. But we're going to change and move over to embroidery. But first we have to talk about, do all the feet work with all the different machines? One of the things I absolutely love about Husqvarna Viking is that when they move from one machine to another, that you can use almost always all the feet and to most of the, a great extent, all the hoops for that matter. And the reason for that is when I look back uh, 50 years, uh, 1980, maybe it's not 50, maybe it's 40 years, um, I had an A-foot on my Optima 630, and that Optima 630 A-foot would fit on an Epic 2 today. It would fit on any of the machines that we're looking at. 
Isn't that incredible that they really make it possible if you have different feet that you can use them from one machine to another. Now, there are a few feet on the Epic 95Q and the Epic 2 that will not work. And that is, has to do with the new feeding system. And, the, and that feeding system means that there's extra feet teeth in the front. And so some of the feet, like the one with the bar in the, the middle, that one does not work. And also, here's a little example. Because I haven't talked about this yet, but I, I want to make sure we talk about this. If you have a designer SE or older machines like Platinums or Lilies or any of those machines, all of our machines going back all that far, they have a true satin stitch, which a lot of the other machines on the market do not have. If you're using a zigzag for your satin stitch you and you have a Husqvarna Viking, you have a satin stitch that's absolutely, oh, look, I'm showing you the back. That satin stitch is just spectacular. And the difference between a zigzag and a satin stitch is that it goes straight across and then down, straight across and then down. So it gives you a very, very rich look. So for a lot of other machines that are on the market, they use a zigzag and they scrunch it up closer together. That is not a, a nice quality satin stitch. And all of you that have a Husqvarna Viking, except on the emeralds, have this beautiful, beautiful satin stitch. Now, this is a little landscape that I did. And this is kind of a fun little project. And you can see how rich the satin stitch looks here. But I also wanted to show you along the edge. You can see that fancy decorative stitch. That's called a Spanish hem stitch. That is a foot that we've had for many, many, many years, for probably 20 some odd years. And one of the feet that won't work with the Epic 2 and the uh, the uh, Epic 95Q is the Spanish hem stitch. And it's because there's a new feeding system in the front. And I, I'll pull up a short uh, close up so you can see what I'm talking about. So that's one foot that if you had it wouldn't work on the new machines. But there's usually a very logical reason. 99% of all of our feet will move, work from one machine to the other. So uh, somebody commented that they recently got an uh, Opal 960Q because it's lighter weight. It is a little bit of a different sound to it, right? And But it's a great sewing machine. What I like to do is I'll set my machine up. I have my Opal and set up on a machine, on a, on a table that's set for a straight stitch, and I'll just piecing there. And then I've got my Sapphire 85 set up with all my hoops for uh embroidery and then i have my epic 2 set up for something completely different so um and i use the machines all interchangeably so it's nice if you've got the luxury to have more than one machine a lot of people when they decide to get a new machine they'll keep their other one and as a second machine so that they can be sewing if um for the person who was commenting about the the uh opal 690q i if you find that it's a little noisy i would do two things i would change the needle because a good part of the time, when the needle is not as sharp, it when it goes through the fabric, it makes a clunking noise. And that may be what you're hearing. So the first thing I would do is clean out your bobbin area and put a new needle in and make sure it's got a nice sharp point to it. And that kind of thing can really work well. Um, sometimes it, it'll solve it. And the other thing I would do is check your thread, right? Some threads are really not meant. I know people that try and sew with quilting thread. Uh, a lot of times when you see something that says quilting thread, check and make sure it's not hand quilting thread because hand quilting thread is not meant to be used in the sewing machine. So kind of change it out, change the needle, change the thread, and you might find a big difference in that. And so the new, uh, another question we have is a platinum 70, I think it's a 75Q. And um, that is, a, there's a couple of choices you have. The uh, Sapphire... 930 would be kind of an equal choice. But if I, if I were you, I would be looking at the Brilliant 75Q, which would be a step up. And it does have some beautiful Omnimotion stitches. It has the ability to change the density of a stitch. And then also, if you're looking for more space for like maybe you're a quilter and you want more space, I would always look at the Epic 95Q because that's, between the Brilliant 75 and the Epic 95 too, that's where your sweet spot is. If you've had a Platinum, then that would be a good choice to look at both of those. 
the ep, uh, a, a question was between the Epic 980Q and the Epic 95Q. There's a question about the difference of that. And I think it is just, I'm going to go over to the machine because I want you to see a couple of things, all right? So the Epic 980Q did not have, let me see if I can get in here. I'm going to just move this quilt aside. So it did have the automatic needle threader that we have, but it does not have the new feeding system and the built-in walking foot. So when you're looking, let me see if I can get this in here for you good enough. All right. On our Epic 95Q and our Epic 2, the opening in the stitch plate here is nine millimeters and there's extra rows of feet teeth right in the front. You'll see these extra rows here. And that allows you for really even perfect feeding. The other thing that you have is a built-in walking foot. And I'm going to see if I can get this down for you so you can get a better look at this. All right. At the back of the Epic 95Q, you'll notice that there's a built-in walking foot now. And so there's no more reason to use the interchangeable walking foot. All of the feet that have a back that cut out in them, they all will fit on like that. And now you'll have your walking foot working all the time instead of just when you want to put it on. The walking foot is fabulous because now we don't have to take the ankle off to put it on. And it means that we can use it for a lot of sewing that we didn't use it before. I know a lot of people who they have the interchangeable walking foot, but they often don't think about putting it on because they've got to change the ankle. Because it is integrated into the Designer Epic 2 and the Epic 95Q, it's just there all the time and it's working all the time. The um, oh, This is so fabulous. I'm so excited to see these questions. All right, there's a question about the Scandinavia 200. Now, the Scandinavia 200 was very much like the Frisia 415. And if you're looking at, let me see if I can go to that slide, go back to where the Frisia was here. So the Frisia 415 would be like the Scandinavia 200. And the Opal 650 uh, would be equal to it. If you go to the Opal 670, you're definitely getting more stitches and you have an automatic thread cutter, all right? And the automatic thread cutter is nice. It means the selective thread cutter, when you touch it, it will uh, cut the top thread and bottom. But honestly, okay, just this is me saying this, okay? This is not the company saying this. I would never go to the 670. I would go to the 690 because you're getting a ton of extra features. You're still staying with the same size body shape, but you have the sensor system on the Opal 690 that is not on the Opal 670. You have the automatic needle threader, uh, the automatic cutter. So when you touch the scissors, it will cut the top thread, but then you need to manually lift your foot up. That sensor system is unbelievably fabulous. So you should go into the store and test both of them. Sit down with the with your the person in the store and say, okay, I want to sit at a at an Opal 670 and an Opal 690. Let's see what the differences are. And I'll tell you, the difference between a 650 is fabulous. The, the Opal 650 has a traditional tension where you need to change it. The Opal 670 has got automatic tension. So that's a perfect reason to choose that. But if you haven't sat at a new machine for a while, Honestly, you should be looking at the Opal 690. They're all in a really reasonable range, price range. And the, that Opal 690 having the sensor system, the automatic tension, and the automatic cut are really, it's, it's worthwhile considering that, okay? There's a reason why they have three uh, machines in the line. The 650 does not have automatic tension where the 670 does. And so there's some things for you to think about. But the best idea is to go into the store and start, you know, sit down at each of the machines, bring in the material that you think you want to work with, especially if you like to work with different things. We have a question about trading in um, older machines for newer machines. And I can tell you from my experience being out there in all of the stores, almost all the stores 
will take trade in. Now, whether you'd feel like you're getting enough value for that trade in, that's a personal choice. Like maybe you decide they're going to offer you $50 for your machine. Maybe you just as soon keep it and give it to your grandchild or somebody else you know. It's a, it really becomes a, a personal choice at that point. But definitely go in and talk to your dealer because they will say, yes, of course I'll do trade-ins and this is what we're going to give you. And what machine is it you're interested in? Because sometimes if you're considering a machine like an Epic 2, they might give you a more generous trade-in than if you're just kind of going from a, a low end to another low end machine. So that, that can make a big difference in how much you're going to get for a trade-in also. Every store has got a different policy and it's really important that you talk to the dealer and, you know, really talk to them about what it is you're interested in. Check out their class schedule and what they do for classes. Now that things are opening up again, that's getting a lot easier to do. Okay. We have another question about the Brilliance 80 and she loves it and she wants to do embroidery machine. Wait a second here. One of the same embroidery style machine with a built-in walking foot. Well, wow. So the exact trade-in for a Brilliance 80, the exact level would be the Brilliance 75Q that you're seeing here, right? That would give you the same sewing machine, but it won't give you the built-in walking foot. There's only two machines that we have that have the built-in walking foot. And that would be the Epic 95Q and the Designer Epic 2, which is the embroidery machine. So if you're looking for a sewing machine that had the built-in walking foot and has that larger space, look at the space you have, then definitely go in and test drive the 95Q, the Epic 95Q, okay? And let's look at, is, is there any other questions before I keep going? I just want to see what this next slide is here. Now, well, let's talk a little bit about an embroidery because I know many of you are moving or thinking about moving from a sewing machine into embroidery, or you're considering going from one embroidery machine to another. So before we go too far, if the Jade 35 is an entry level embroidery machine. It does a 240 by 150 hoop. And I think I had one of those here, but, and uh, so it's, it's a nice size. It's six by 10 inches. And it's got a lot of nice stitches to it, too. It's, it's you know, it's a pretty good machine to uh, get into embroidery with. But if, again, if you're asking me, and you are, we also have the Topaz 40, which has some extra stitches to it and some really nice features. It has the same size embroidery as the Jade 35 does. But my preference, without a doubt, on the Topaz line is to go to the Topaz 50. Because the Topaz 50 has a touch screen and it also has basic design positioning, which lets you be able to take uh, do end edge quilting and to do larger embroideries and have them all lined up. I think that, you know, a lot of people get into it and they might go in with a Jade or a Topaz 40 and very soon they want to do larger designs and they want to be able to do... Um, you know, have more features on their machine. And the Topaz 50 is the very first machine that has design positioning to it. So let's look at the different size hoops, all right? So if you have a designer SE, for example, or an older embroidery machine, the designer SE had one hoop that was 240 by 150, and then it had the mega hoop, which had three positions. It was 14 inches by six inches. It was narrow. And the design had to be broken up into three pieces. When we moved into our newer lines with the designer diamond and then came the topaz line, we have now one hoop that is eight inches wide by 14 and a quarter, quarter inches long. The embroidery you can do with a topaz 50 and with a ruby deluxe or ruby royale is exactly the same. This is eight inches by 14 and a quarter. Okay. So the nice thing about that is it is a lot nicer than a designer SE hoop that was broken up into three inches. So if you like the idea of doing larger embroideries, the Topaz 40 will not do an embroidery this big and neither will the Jade 35. If we're looking between, let's go back here. 
if we're looking between the Topaz 50 and the Sapphire 85, there's huge differences here. The Sapphire 85 replaced a lot of machines. It replaced the Brilliance 80. The Brilliance 80 was out there for a short period of time. And then they decided to make the screen bigger. So they retired the, the Brilliance 80 and brought in the Sapphire 85 that has a larger touch screen. It's like a tablet. It's just beautiful. And then it also replaced the Diamond Royale and the Ruby Royale. And of course, the Diamond Deluxe and the Ruby Deluxe. Now, the Sapphire 85Q has the ability to use the Majestic Hoop. This is a hoop that's called the Majestic Hoop. It's 14 and a quarter by 13 and three quarters. It's the largest hoop in the industry. There is nobody else that has a hoop as big as this. The Sapphire 85 can use it. The Diamond Royale and the Diamond Deluxe can use it. And all and the original Diamond. And then, and I say, say that, but um, the Deluxe definitely. But the Rubies, the original Rubies, the, Di the Ruby Deluxe, the Ruby Royale, they cannot use this size hoop. So if you like the idea of getting into a Majestic Hoop, that is, it's almost square, 14 inches, then the Sapphire 85 or the Ruby 90 or the Epic 2 are the machine you want to go to. The Sapphire 85 has your traditional 8-inch hoop. And then this is an optional hoop, the Majestic Hoop, that you can get to go with it. There are 21 optional hoops that work for our machines. And the reason for that is as we go from one machine to another, then they don't just allow them. Like if you had, a, for example, a Designer SE, you can take your Designer SE 100 by 100 hoop and it will work on the new embroidery machines. And so will the 240 by 150 hoop. The one that won't work is the 360 by, uh, the it's called the Mega Hoop. And that's because we don't need it anymore because that has to be divided up. Now we have this huge area that we can embroider in. So let's look at the Epic, Designer Epic 2, and the Ruby 90. The Ruby 90 is the same body shape as the Designer Epic 2. It has the same ability to do embroidery. And it can use the Majestic Hoop. And more importantly, it can use a 10-inch wide hoop by 14 and a quarter. This is all one position. You can do absolutely fabulously huge designs working like with this size of hoop. So it is really an important thing to think about how big an embroidery design do you want to do when you're working with it. I do have a couple of designs like this one right here. Here's an example. This was an embroidery design that I originally did with my designer SE. And because we only had a six inch wide hoop, I had to do the embroidery on one half of it, and then I did the embroidery on the other half. And because there still wasn't enough room, the little flower that's in between here at the top and the bottom, I had to rehoop that separately. Now, this would still, if I wanted to do this in all one embroidery, this would not be able to fit in a Topaz 50 or in the Sapphire 85. But because the Epic 2, and the, the Ruby 90 have this large hoop. You can see this would be a piece of cake to do in here, right? So if you love embroidery, I always recommend you go to the biggest hoop that will work with your machine. Okay, let's see what else we've got going on here. We have a question about the multi-needle. You know, quite honestly, I did um, play around with the multi-needle for a while when we had it. I did not check that. And I, I don't believe that we still have it in the lineup, but I could be totally wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Meredith's look on the website and see. And the website's a great resource, right, when you're trying to find out information. What I love about that is, and I printed off a copy of this myself just to see. For every machine, if you're looking at a sewing machine or you're looking at an embroidery machine, there's a comparison chart. When you go to the comparison chart, it will tell you all the machines that are in that line. If it's an embroidery machine, it will have all the embroidery machines. 
And then it will give you page after page of exactly what is different from one machine to another. It's not always helpful if you don't know a lot about embroidery because, you know, what do you know about what the sensor system is if you've never seen it? And so that's why it's really good. You know, I know that it's easy sometimes to look up information online, but it really does make sense to go in and find a dealer that you love to work with and that you're interested in seeing what they're doing. You know, if, if you can see they know their machines and that they know the difference between one or the other, and if they don't, they can find out, right? For me, it's all about what do I want to do? If I want the best sewing machine, then what I'm going to do is look at the Epic 2. And if I think maybe that's more than I want, then I'll go down to the a Brilliant 75Q. If I'm looking at the embroidery, I'm going to start looking at the top, which would be the Epic 2. And then if I decided that maybe it's more than I need, then that's where you're going to go down. You can say, all right. I want to look at the Ruby 90 and what's different about the Ruby 90 and the Epic 2. The biggest difference is the Ruby 90 does not have the built-in walking foot. It does not have the laser. And I'll show you the laser in a moment for those of you that want to see it. It does not have the nine millimeter stitches opening for it, right? But the body size is the same. So maybe you're not much of a sewer and you want to be using your machine mostly for embroidery, the Ruby 90 might be a really good option for you because the new features that are on the Epic 2 are especially fabulous working with um, in the sewing because they have, they're all features that somebody that's sewing, garments, different fabrics, quilters, they would absolutely love and adore. Okay, so uh, Meredith did answer me. Uh, wait a second here, just let me answer. The the multi-needle, wait a second here. It's still showing up on the the, um, the list of machines. Um, and there's possible some dealers have it. But as far as we know, um, that will be going out. So you might go into a store and find that multi-needle and it'll be there in some of the dealer stores. But we don't believe that it's going to be uh, continued. Um, and usually when they stop continuing something, it means there's something else new coming out too, right? And often that's a really good time to buy a machine. When, when you see that a new machine is coming out and maybe you don't have a budget for a new machine, it's often a really good time to go shopping because you know that with a new machine coming in, that if the dealer has any stock, sometimes you can get fabulous prices on it. I always thought it was kind of funny that people, um, you know, were saying, oh, well, I'm going to wait till the new one. If you wait for the new one, it may not be what you want. So go and look at them now. And sometimes the dealers have really great deals to offer you. And they're also willing that if when a new machine comes out, that they'll let you trade up and you won't lose anything for a period of time. So just because um, a new machine is going away doesn't mean it's not going to be supported. And I know that especially with the multi needle, there are quite a few uh, videos online that you can go and look at and as far as all of the other machines too and the um one other thing that i want to let me just come back here one other thing i want you to really think about too is what you don't realize we're kind of behind the scenes and we see a lot of exciting things happening i can tell you that the education department is changing it, I can't even I can't even tell you most of the things that's happening. But what we're doing and the way we're redeveloping our education department, there is going to be so much help and support coming your way that you might not have necessarily seen. And I guarantee you, you've never seen it to this level. So I think it's a very, very exciting time to get a new machine because not only are we doing Facebook Lives, there are lots and lots of videos that are happening, and they're happening in different ways. There's a lot of things happening on YouTube, and there's a lot of new ways that we're going to be giving you information and training on different things. So there's your dealer is a, is a great support and the first place you want to go, but a lot of times people don't necessarily have the ability to bring the machine into the store. So we're going to give you a lot more options of ways of learning and making the most out of your machine. So what you've seen today, I think over the last six months to a year, we've we've done we've shown that we're going to do things differently. But where we are next year is it's just going to 
it's going to be amazing. You're going to love, love where we're going. So it, it's super exciting. And I, I can't, it's just a perfect time to be here and to be working with this. All right. We have another question. If I have a DDR, which is a designer diamond Royale, if I were going to a newer machine, do I have a suggestion? Well, I definitely have a suggestion for you because the two machines that would offer you more would be the designer Ruby Royale, uh, sorry, the designer Ruby uh, 90 and the Epic 2. So let's just talk a little bit more about what the Epic, what makes the Epic 2 special, right? I showed you the built-in walking foot. So if you're a quilter, I would love that. Or even if you like to work with different fabrics, I'm just going to back this camera away. One of the things that makes the biggest difference and with our both the Ruby 90 and the Epic 2 is the telescopic threading. Look at the way that telescopic threading works. So you'll find that you have, I don't know if you can see, I'm going to move it back here a little bit so I can get an idea of whether this is looking. So when you are putting a spool of thread on, instead of the spool holders going sideways like they do on your Ruby, and uh, on your Diamond Royale, they have a spool holder like this, and they have spools that stand up, very much like a serger. They call that telescopic threading. And so you're going to get much, much better feeding of your thread. All right, let me come back here a little bit more, and I'll come up here so you can see. All right, the thread gets caught up here onto the top, and then... It's going to come over here, and then you thread it in a traditional way. I'll put this back down. All right. And we have our regular tension that's up top, and then we have the deluxe stitch system, right, which gives us absolutely phenomenal embroidery. But we have one of my favorite things in the world is the automatic needle threader. So right now that threaded my needle and I can just take my thread and put it underneath. But if you're going in embroidery, you wouldn't even touch it. You would just let the thread go and you would, it makes it faster in embroidery. So if you have the choice, if you have a chance, I would definitely go in and check out the Epic 2. And the Ruby 90 is less expensive than the Epic 2. The Ruby... 90 does not have nine millimeter stitch opening and it does not have the built-in walking foot and it does not have the laser so with the laser say you're doing parallel stitching quilting and stuff like that you it will bring you rows and rows of completely parallel stitching and the laser i i've used it all the time you know where i found the laser work them absolutely most amazing was when you're sewing two pieces of binding together. You know how you flip one on the other and you need to go from the point to the point? I, I've never done such a perfect do job of sewing binding pieces together, working with that laser. And I'll go over there in a second and just show you what that looks like. So the main difference in embroidery, the Ruby 90 and the Epic 2 are very similar. But... The uh, Epic 2 has more stitches. It's got the built-in laser, the built-in walking foot, and it's got a nine millimeter stitch opening, which you saw those stitches, how beautiful they were, right? So let me just see. Look at, look at how much of a difference it means. Your average every stitch, when you're looking at them, that's a huge difference in decorative stitches. So if you like to use your decorative stitches, then, you know, consider the Epic 2. Oh, wait a second. I'm going to go back to this one. Hold on. I'm going to get some fabric. And we're going to come in here. Now, the laser. All right. I wasn't thinking about doing this, but this makes a lot of sense to do it. So hold on one second. Let me just grab some fabric. All right. And I hope you can see it. So maybe I wanted to do a seam allowance. That is two inches. Or maybe, let's see, I'm just going to sew two pieces together. Okay. So the laser, 
you can turn it on and it's right over right here. This is your laser button. All right. I don't have the laser centered. You can see it. It's showing up over here. So maybe I wanted to do a wider seam allowance. That will guide me. But the most amazing part about this is if you wanted to do parallel rows of stitching. Hold on. I'm going to put my camera down here for a second. All right. Over here, this is where you can decide. Do you want the laser to be centered or not? If you want it centered, this number would say zero. If you want the laser line thicker, you can make it thicker or thinner by just adjusting the uh, number on the bottom and it'll make the line thicker. So I'm going to make move the laser more over to the right. And look, you can kind of see this, the line, right? So it is perfect for doing different kinds of seam allowances and also for doing parallel lines of stitching. So if I wanted to start stitching, I could sew there. And then the next row, I would go and move the laser onto the row that I finished stitching and then do another row. And every single line would be perfectly parallel and amazingly straight. And I, I've actually done this with things, and I've showed them a couple of times before how much of a difference that makes. So if you're a sewer, for me, the designer Epic 2, there, there isn't a better machine on the market, honestly. It is just fabulous, and it, it is giving you the bigger stitches. You've got the Omnimotion stitches that we have. There's laser stitches. There's embellishing stitches and fringe stitches. There's, of course, our applique stitches. Any stitch that was on a Diamond Royale or a Brilliance or a Ruby Royale, they will all be on the Ruby 90 and the Epic 2. The Epic 2 does have more stitches with it, though, and it has a lot more features to it. And so that's why there's a bit of a difference in the price. But worthwhile looking at both and especially worthwhile talking about you know, ask ask your dealer or your store, you know, what would be the difference if I went with one machine or the other? And then you can make, uh, you know, a choice. At least you know what the differences are. If you're really thinking about upgrading, looking on the website and look at the Epic 2 and down on every single machine that you open up is a comparison chart. And it will give you the comparisons from the top of the line down so you can see what features you're losing as you go from one machine to another. I always start at the top and then figure out what's going to meet my price range. And, you know, everybody has a budget that they have to be working with, but almost all your dealers are going to be willing to say, okay, well, maybe this is where I want to go today. And maybe another year or two, I'm going to move up to something else. And they're going to make it possible for you because they want to make you happy, right? And they don't want you to get in where, you know, that is maybe more than what you need. So talking to your store really makes a big difference. Um, I, You know what? Somebody commented that I'd love to see the laser doing uh, to do the binding. I am going to do that in another show. I, I should have had it set up. I didn't think about it. But um, I will definitely do that in another show. But let's just take a few minutes because I, you know, we are really, um, we're very lucky. We have 150 years, our anniversary. And when you see where we've come from, there have been so many different changes over the year. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up some of the slides. I put them all together in order so you can look at where we came and where we are. Now, there's a lot of machines in between because usually when they record a new machine line, they're recording the top of the line and then the other machines that fall underneath it don't always get recorded historically, right? So I know when I look at history, I won't see an Optima 630 there, but I will see the machine that was the top of the line at that point and it will have my, the, my machine that was underneath that would have less features to it. So let's just go and look at the very first, this was our very first machine. Isn't it absolutely gorgeous? When you look at those gold features, and this was the first model, and it was given the name Northern Star, and I'm not going to try and pronounce the this, this Swedish name of it, but it is beautiful, and you can see it's got a hand crank on the side uh, to turn the hand wheel, and now when I go and look at the next one, this one is far more ornate. You can see this model was around for a lot of a uh, lot of years it was manufactured from 1883 to 1925 and it had gears and uh, mechanical parts 
and they were all enclosed so that you were less likely to be able to, um, you know, gum them up and get things into them. So this was a real step up. And this particular machine was manufactured for a long, long time. Now, and, and when you start to see features that you recognize, then you'll know how long you've been uh, exposed to Husqvarna Viking. Now, this is a real traditional looking machine. It was the one, the first one that had an oscillating bobbin. And you know, today there are still machines that don't use an oscillating bobbin. I love the oscillating bobbin. I like it much better than the other style because I feel like it gives me better tension when I'm working with different uh, artistic problem, uh, pro projects. And this was born, um, it dominated the world market for more than 50 years. So that, again, was for a long time. It was created in 1903. The next machine was introduced in 1947. And these are basically the different steps. What changed from one level to the other? This was the first free arm machine in 1947. And it was also the first machine that had a zigzag stitch imagine in 1947 that they introduced the first zigzag stitch and having the ability to do that and the free arm meant it was much easier to make garments and that was a huge step up and probably finish off edges of quilts and things like that as they were sewing so wait a second here in 1953 the class 20 was introduced and this one had a very important feature that's true of our machines today. We have a jam proof hook, which means that as you're sewing, you can sew off the fabric and you won't jam up uh, the bobbin and mess it up. And that doesn't work uh, with all machines. That's something that we've been famous for since 1953. The other thing is that it didn't need to be oiled. And that was the very first model that came out now, this also was, it weighed like a tank. It's very heavy. And you can imagine the uh, metal outside, how heavy these machines would be. They would be heavier than our machines that we have today. Even our Designer Epic 2 would not be as heavy as this. And the next machine we have was in 1960. And this one had the biggest innovation yet. All right. It was color-coded and it had an automatic feed for elastic stitches. And so elastic stitches, my I know one of mine, when my Optima 630, it had elastic stitches, which meant that you could sew a stitch that would go back and forth and give you a lot of stretch in the material. And back then in the 60s and 70s, we were sewing with a lot of double knits. They were horrible fabrics. I mean, some of the quality was of fabrics was crazy, but Having a machine that had an elastic stitch was a very, very important change that led to a lot of new sewers starting to sew their clothes. And next we have, this was looking a little bit closer to the machine that I had. And it was part of the Centennial series. And this was the very first machine that was not only oil-free, but lubrication-free. And that meant that the oil was extruded through the metal and when the machine was working it was keeping everything lubricated without the consumer having to add any lubrication to it and so i know and i'm telling you this honestly i know a lot of people that i sew when i go to quilting retreats and stuff like that and they bring their oil with them because their machine needs to be oiled regularly i i cannot imagine having to have oil around my fabric. And every time since that Optima 630 that I had back in 1981, I have never had to oil a machine in my life. And I can't imagine wanting to go into a machine where you'd have to do that. So that's an important thing. If you're looking at other lines, make sure that you don't have to oil them because who's fun of Viking, you do not need to oil your machines. All right. All right. There was a question about going back to the 1960 model that, you put the cams in the back of it. You know, they did not mention the cams on the back, but it mentions the micro adjustments. Wait a second here. Let me go back for a second. I, I'm not sure. I think the cams came later. And um, but that would be a good question. I'll answer, I'll find that out and then I'll get back to you. I think the cams were a little later than this, but uh, because these machines here didn't have a ton of extra stitches with it. But let's look and see. Now this machine. The machine, wait a second here, my screen didn't change. There we go. And 
The next machine is 1979. So this looks very, very much like my Optimus 630. And this is the model 6680. It was the first computer sewing machine. And it used a microcomputer to electronically guide the information and the stitch patterns. And that made a huge difference, right? And then the next year in 60, uh, the 6690 came out and it had their first writing sewing machine. And so they considered the fact that you could do letters to be a writing sewing machine. And I remember how excited people were when they were showing me that they could write somebody's name. And uh, I mean, where, where we are today with embroidery was only a dream in somebody's eye. It was certainly never something that we expected we'd be able to do. It kind of makes you wonder in the next 30 or 40 years where we'll be and what will be possible. All right, and then we've got our 1994. We had the number one plus called the Viking Orchidea. And this was an extraordinary machine. It was the first machine that allowed us to do embroidery. It had one, one touch directional stitch sewing. It had our sewing advisor. This is our first machine that had the sewing advisor. And there you can select the fabric. And, you know, today we, we are just have that so much of ability to be able to sew with using the different fabrics that no other machines can do the way that we can do it. But we have an info display that gave us an electronic info display and it had the omni motion stitches and professional quality embroidery. Now, if you think back to those machines, hold on a second here, I'll see if I can find this. So when you look at these stitches, these are the omni motion stitches. Most of these were on that number one plus going back. All those years, 25 years, we had beautiful stitches that look like this. And so from then on, any of our embroidery machines that came out um, that were the top of the line, they did have these beautiful wider decorative stitches. They've become the norm today. But the, back then in um, back then in 1994, that was considered pretty extraordinary because nobody had seen not only decorative stitches that had that kind of quality, but also the ability to change the embroidery. Now, what I remember about the one plus is you had to manually drop the feed teeth. Imagine if we had to do that today. We've we've kind of gotten out of the habit of, you know, we can move from sewing to embroidery and uh, without even thinking about it. But back then it was a little bit of work to do the embroidery and we had to drop the feed teeth. And then the next machine, somebody was on this call that said, this is the, in 1998, we came out with the designer one. And it was miraculous because it had the sensor foot lift. So it would automatically lift the foot up when you uh, stopped with the needle down. And it sensed how much fabric was underneath. the So we could go up and down over fabrics. It had the, um, sensor, the, the sensor foot pressure, thread cutters, and a color touch screen dis display that even today is actually pretty nice to look at it if you have a designer one. And then it had the built-in disk drive with the floppies. It was much bigger than the OnePlus. So that was a huge advantage to people that were quilters and like to work with larger, larger fabrics. And, you know, like uh, curtains and drapes and things where they were very bulky. That made a huge difference. And then we've only got a couple more to go. We have the, in 2004, we came out with the Designer SE. Now, this was groundbreaking for a few different reasons. It had a much nicer screen. And it also had LED lights and embroidery advisor, and it worked with a USB connectivity. So you didn't need to deal with the, the floppies anymore. So instead of having to buy lots of floppies, you could buy a couple of USB sticks and you could put uh, so many designs on there. It was really amazing to see how that worked. And then we're moving into the modern day. And in 2011, we came out with the first machine that had the deluxe sewing system, uh, stitch system. And that gave us a far better quality embroidery. The deluxe stitch system metered out only as much thread that was needed for the weight of the fabric. And so if you were working with a very sheer fabric, it would use less thread. And if you were working with a very thick fabric, it would use more, but it only metered out what it needed. And it made it much, much easier to work with metallic threads and challenging threads 
because of the um, the deluxe stitch system, but it also had a 10 inch wide opening. So I know when I went from the designer SE to the diamond, I love the diamond. On the sewing side of things, the biggest difference was I was able to change the density of all my stitches. And I, I had a far superior stitching going from an SE to a diamond, but the embroidery was extraordinary. This did not happen with the original diamond. It was a diamond deluxe that added the deluxe stitch system in. And then the diamond Royale had the same system at the same, uh, that worked the same way. The diamond Royale also had a lot of other exclusive stitch techniques that the diamond uh, deluxe did not. And then we moved into the first machine that had a tablet light screen. It has so many fabulous features. It had the automatic needle threader. And it was the top of the line machine that everybody was envious about. It had beautiful colors. It had 12, more than 12 inches from the needle to the tower. But really the space that you have up here from the top to the bottom really was what made you uh, able to work with king size quilts without having any issues. Now, after the Epic was out for a little while, we did make some changes going to the designer Epic 2. And this one added completely new features that we've never heard of and most of us never even dreamed of wanting, but they are just extraordinary. So we have the integrated dual feed, which means integrated walking foot is part of the machine. We have nine millimeter stitches and the stitch plate opening. It is Wi-Fi enabled, which means we can send things through Wi-Fi back and forth from our computer, from the internet onto our machine and from our machine to our computer. It also has a design placement app that'll let us be able to put our um, what we're embroidering in our hoop, the picture of what is in our hoop and have it show up on our screen. And you've seen me do that a few times. It has the ribbon embroidery attachment capability, which only the machines that have that larger body have the ability to do that. So, it, you know, it really has taken us to a whole new level. And I know that, in, you know, in eight minutes, you really cannot do justice to 150 years of history, but I hope you've enjoyed going back and kind of looking at what the different machines were and when everything came back. I'll post that little, um, I have a little video of it. I'll post it on my Facebook page. So if anybody wants to go back and just look at the history of it again, uh, I think it's fascinating to look at where we were and where we've come to. And I hope you've had fun today um, going a little bit back into history and go and talk to your store. Give them a call, even if you can't go and give them a call and start talking about it. If you think you're interested in a new machine, the best place, look on the Who's Farnet Viking website, pull up the machine you're interested in and look at that comparison chart because I've never seen something so clear and easy to read in my life. And it's, you know, bring it in with you so that if you're talking and you don't know what something is, you can say, well, what is the deluxe stitch system? Can you show me what that does? And they will... I'll be happy to help you figure out what is the right machine for you. And that really is what it's all about, right? If you're thinking about a new machine, you just don't want any machine. You want a machine that's going to take you into the next 20 years. So it means you want a machine that's got new features to it, but also something that's going to fit into your price range of what is, you know, what's important to you. So thank you for joining me today. I had a wonderful time and I hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to the next time. I don't even remember writing down what it is I've got coming up next. But uh, I hope to see you again soon. So goodbye, everybody. And thank you for joining me for this wonderful hour.